I had this kind of, you know, idea of Christianity being right, like a little bit, like as you described, right, like used as a form of slave control, like you know, uh, imposed upon, forced upon um, enslaved Africans. And when I actually started doing the reading in the actual historical sources from the 17th and 18th century, that's why I was so shocked to realize that not only was Christianity not being imposed, it was it was being violently rejected by Protestant enslavers. Well, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome again to another episode of the Bisrot Podcast. Uh, I am your host, Vince Bantu, and uh, and I uh, host this podcast here entitled The Bisrot, or The Gospel, uh, which is a, a program and a ministry of the Jew 3 Project, which is all about equipping the body of Christ and the Black community and the Black church with resources to be able to understand what we believe and why, and to be able to give an answer for the faith that we have. And in this particular podcast, uh, The Bisrot, uh, we explore topics uh, through lectures and through conversations. We explore topics that are specific and pertinent to early African Christianity. Um, and, and we bring scholarly resources to bear on questions in our community that are relevant. And today I am extremely honored to be joined in, in a dialogue um, with a, uh, a colleague and friend, Dr. Catherine Gerbner. Uh, and so uh, we are, are so excited to welcome Dr. Catherine Gerbner today to uh, join in a discussion on uh, the title of this episode on the Bisrod podcast, which is, is Islam the original religion of African slaves in the Americas? Uh, and so we are going to be talking today about uh, that question in particular, but also more broadly, just the nature of religion uh, and the religious dynamics of early African slaves in the Americas. And also uh, what religious backgrounds even were looking like uh, on the other side of the, the Middle Passage. But but before we get into it again, I'm so excited. And I just want to welcome and introduce Dr. Gerbner uh, to us today. Uh, and we're going to get into this uh, conversation. Um, but Dr. Catherine Gerbner uh, is an historian and the author of the amazing book, Christian Slavery, Conversion and Race in the Protestant Atlantic World, which she has presented on even here uh, at the Jew Through Project before, which shows how religion was fundamental to the development of slavery and race. Dr. Gerbner received her PhD from Harvard University in 2013. And she is currently the Samuel Russell Chair in the Humanities and Associate Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Gerbner's research examines the history of race and religion, the origins of white supremacy, and theories of conversion. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, The Eminent Frame, Slavery and Abolition, and several other venues. Dr. Gerbner's current research project is on Caribbean reformations as well as constructing religion, defining crime. And so uh, so again, let's all uh, give a warm welcome virtually uh, or physically wherever you're at to Dr. Gerbner. And Dr. Gerbner, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really thrilled to, to be here and to have this conversation with you. So thanks. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, I am as well. And, and so, yeah, we can um, just kind of... Uh, you know, jump into it. Um, we have, you know, we're going to be again. The the title of the episode today. Uh, we've been talking about um, a lot of different topics and themes, and a lot of times they they really have more to do with um, kind of the nature of religion and especially Christianity. Um, you know, in the African continent, and we focus on the pre-colonial period. But I'm really excited for this conversation today, and especially to be talking with really the expert on this topic, because this really helps us to bridge um, the kind of the, you know, the experience on the continent before slavery, but then kind of bridging that over into the experience that that many African Americans are more connected with, which is, you know, slavery and the nature of religion uh, in that in the Middle Passage. Um, and so uh, maybe uh, Dr. Gerbner to start off with, we could just kind of uh, talk a little bit about um, both of us kind of in dialogue about just what was the, you know, before we get to the, the real meaty question of like the, um, the title of the episode, maybe we could just both kind of, you know, have some conversation on um, what were the religions 
that were practiced by the Africans who were brought over to the Americas through the transatlantic slave trade? Like what was the kind of broad religious kind of, uh, you know, landscape? Right. Um, you know, it was incredibly diverse is what I would say, you know, that you uh, you have so many different religious traditions being practiced. So um, sure, there is Islam um, in parts of, uh, you know, especially in the Northwest, um, but also lots of different types of indigenous African religions um, throughout the, the Western coast. And then Christianity was also, you know, I'm you are <laughs> you are sure the expert on on this, but you know uh, it, especially in the coastal region, you know, the Kingdom of Congo was uh, had adopted Catholicism as a state religion um, starting the 15th, 15th century. So uh, yeah, you have a you have a really complex um, and diverse sort of religious history that uh, you have to kind of dig into in order to really understand that um, that sort of that African context. Mm, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more um, that, you know, there definitely was like a, you know, a broad diversity, um, you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, Christianity. And of course, Christianity was, I mean, I guess when slavery got started in the 15th century uh, and, you know, and uh, then slaves started being brought over to the Americas, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries. You know, at that time, uh, you know, Christianity was, um, you know, had been a minority religion in Egypt, um, you know, after the Islamic conquest. And then, um, and it actually had, uh, it had been, you know, the dominant religion in Nubia uh, up until actually, it was almost like right as the slave trade, European slave trade was getting kicked off in the Western side of the continent. That was actually right when Christianity had kind of died out in Nubia, but it had, it had been around for a thousand years. But, uh, but of course, Ethiopia was still a predominantly Christian nation. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, not only that, but, um, there's actually, uh, this is, you know, something that I'm working on right now in terms of research. There's actually evidence of, of like the East African Christianities of Nubia and Ethiopia uh, and Egypt spreading West into Central and West Africa, uh, even, even before Europeans showed up. Um, so, so, and then of course, as you mentioned, like the King of the Congo, like through contacts with Europeans, uh, even Africans that didn't come over and weren't stolen as slaves, uh, it, some of them embraced Christianity in West and Central Africa. And the most, probably the best example is what you brought up. Um, so, you know, there's Christianity, but of course, as you mentioned, there's also Islam. Um, and uh, that's also, you know, that also comes all over, I mean, North Africa, but then as North Africa starts to conquer, uh, and, you know, in different kingdoms in West Africa, you have Islam very, very prevalent in the kingdoms of Mali and Songhai and, and Ghana um, and, uh, and all of that. But, um, but also, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, and I, I wonder whatever, what thoughts you have um, on this as well, and just what evidence we have, but it also seems to me that um, in addition to Christianity and Islam, that there, there also seems to be a lot of uh, African slaves who also their religious identity was more rooted in the traditional kind of African religions. Um, but yeah, I just wonder what, yeah, what thoughts you have on that? Or how did that kind of, how did that population kind of fit into the mix of folks that came over here? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's probably, um, yeah, a huge, a huge number of Africans who are, who are enslaved and stolen from the African continent. Um, yeah, may not have, you know, may not have encountered either Islam or Christianity. And so they were, they were practicing indigenous African religions. Um, and there, you know, you have, a, again, just sort of a huge diversity and complexity there in the, uh, in the, in the religious traditions. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it's just so important to, to, to think about um, the, the dynamism, the complexity, and, um, and also sort of, you know, I think this is something we can get into more, um, which is how do we know what we know, right? So like, what are the sources um, that are giving us information about what we think about right, African religious history in this in this period? Um, and so I'm so curious actually to hear a little bit more about the research you mentioned about sort of Christianity moving to the Western, uh, the Western coast, because that's the kind of research that I think is so important to, um, to to dig in more about because historically so many of our sources and um, sources of knowledge have been from you know these European texts, um, European documents written by enslavers or white missionaries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I think one one aspect of this conversation that we just always have to be cognizant of is like where like 
where our source is coming from, what language are they in, and what is that, um, and how is that sort of filtering our perception of what, you know, what, you know, religious experience was like, um, you know, like let's say the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries in the various parts of coastal West Africa. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more um, that, I mean, we have to be able to look at, you know, like all, all, you know, like kind of all the evidence we have, but especially, um, you know, the literary and material evidence that's coming from, you know, the, uh, the communities that, that we're commenting on. If we're talking about, if we're talking about to use rabbit toes, sla- you know, uh, phrase, if we're talking about slave religion, then we, you know, we definitely need to go to, um, not always the colonizers or the, the foreign missionary, uh, sources, but the sources themselves. And so that's, um, I mean, that's such a great point. And, and so, yeah, kind of like continuing on with that, like, you know, it, you know, just for our like, kind of, you know, for a broad audience, like what, how, how would we, or can we, uh, as we, as we look at all those sources, as we look at sources coming from, you know, slave narratives and from, uh, evidence coming out of, uh, African communities, uh, during the, you know, during this period, 16th, 17th, uh, and even 18th centuries, um, and then, and then also corroborating that with, uh, some of the dominant narratives, like, is it like how would we both like kind of you know just paint some broad brush strokes of like um you know what what were kind of the the religions i mean we already named some of them um but is there a way that we can kind of like talk about which ones were the most prominent if that makes sense or which like kind of mm-hmm. rough rough senses of like based on the evidence um you know which of these religions were you know for the slaves that came over to the americas and were brought over like uh about like were were more of them practicing traditional religions or were you know um yeah were some of them uh and i guess um you know i guess i could just say um and maybe uh you know maybe we could like kind of you know answer this together or we could like yeah. uh, kind of go go later but i mean the the title of our our episode i think is kind of driving this question because yeah. We're we're responding to it historically, but um, but in in the black community, there are many people um, who claim that like all or the majority of of African slaves were Muslim, and um, and this is especially a common concept, you know, uh, and belief in African American and other you know not just African American but other black diasporic Muslim communities, and we our audience here is predominantly black Christians. And so, you know, how do we, you know, that's kind of where we're going in terms of right. like, how would we engage that? Um, so I guess maybe that's kind of two things in one is like, um, how do we, you know, how would we answer that? But then I think one way to get at that is, well, what was the, you know, kind of um, the majority religions, uh, if, if that kind of makes sense. Okay, so in answer to that question, I would say it's it's pretty simple to answer, um, you know, this query about were all, you know, uh, African stolen um, and enslaved, were they Muslim? The answer is no, right? Like that's just, it's not the case. Um, And we know that because we we know, certainly there were Africans who were Muslim. Islam was especially important in the Senegambian region. You know, that is a long, really, like really significant history. Um, And and so, yeah, there's absolutely no denying that. And um, and in fact, there's also a history of, uh, especially in a Latin American context, wanting to suppress that uh, the the reality that there were some Muslims who were enslaved and brought to the Americas. Um, but it was it was the minority for sure. And we know that because we have records from the from the slave trade, right? We know where. Uh, where Africans were enslaved, um, you know, how many were uh, sort of uh, enslaved in various regions on the West African coast. Uh, And, you know, there are some, as with all data, you know, there are some inaccuracies with it, but in general, you get a pretty clear, clear, clear picture of uh, what the regional distribution of uh, of enslavement was, and then that regional distribution can tell you about um, sort of the religious heritage, uh, among other things. And so, uh, so, so yeah, I think that there was, especially in um, you know North America, uh, the British Caribbean, we can say for sure that there were there were Muslims among the Africans who were enslaved, but that they were in the minority, and that. Uh, probably the majority if you you know 
and again, these are all with caveats because I'm a historian and I'm always like, well, we gotta be you know, careful about the sources. Majority uh, likely were practicing um, indigenous African religions. And then there were also definitely Christians. Um, and, and I say that also though, uh, with the caveat that just as I was saying, you know, there are, we know that uh, in some cases, sort of the history of Islam has been um, sort of among enslaved Africans has been suppressed. Absolutely, especially within North America and the British colonies, the history of Christian Africans has been suppressed for very political reasons, which are, you know, because of the way that sort of slave law and the relationship between religion and race developed in in the the Protestant colonies, like you know what became the United States, um, and then the the British Caribbean colonies, uh, there it was supposed to be illegal, right, to enslave Christians. And so, if you're enslaving Christians in Africa, you weren't gonna, you know, you don't necessarily want to highlight that fact. And so, uh, there's absolutely a suppression of the fact mm -hmm. that there were Christians enslaved. Wow. I wonder, I, I'm just, I'm so interested in that. Could you, could you maybe share a little bit more about what that kind of, yeah, what that looked like and, you know, like some examples of that? Cause that's so, I mean, that's again, that's not, that's out of my, you know, you know, kind of expertise. So I'm just curious about, yeah, what that, what that looked like in terms of the suppressing of, of African Christianity, you know, in, in the Americas. Oh, yes. So, um, actually, you know, just today I was, I was, uh, skimming an article that was about, uh, African Christians who were trying to sue for their freedom in Spain. Um, so not in, this is sort of a different context, but it's, I think it's 16th century, suing their, for their freedom on the, on the premise or on the basis that they were Christian. And, um, and so therefore, you know, even in, within the terms of just war, which is how a lot of European Christians justified slavery, uh, they shouldn't have been enslaved within that context. And, um, and so, you know, there's a historian, Chloe Ayrton, who, who's written this article uh, using, uh, yeah, the court records uh, showing showing sort of this, and here you have like it bubbling up, right? Like this is one of those instances where you're like, oh, this is tip of the iceberg, right? Like the this existing documentary evidence of African Christians arguing within a court in um, Spain that because they're Christian, they shouldn't be enslaved. Uh, and you know that, that's, it's just, that means there are a lot more who didn't make it to that point. Um, and within, you know, within a, we'll say an American, like North American context, uh, there are, uh, you know, inklings where you'll, you'll, you'll realize that someone probably was Christian, um, you know, but they are being sort of not viewed as Christian because, uh, you know, and this is really what my first book is about, because especially Protestants, um, they thought of Christianity as a religion for free people. And so they did not want to uh, admit uh, admit that any Africans were Christian before that they were enslaved because that un undermined the justification for enslaving them, um, nor did they want to allow uh, Africans and their descendants who were enslaved in the Americas to be baptized in the in Protestant churches because they were worried that that would um, give them certain rights and privileges, uh, including potentially, you know, uh, freedom. So there is a yeah absolutely long history of suppression of 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 African Christian identity um, and then also of of the of the right of Africans and their descendants to be baptized in in, in the Protestant churches. Wow, that's so that's so fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder, I just, you know, I wonder if that um, even like that suppression kind of um, is even why there's not as many. It seems like again, this isn't my area of expertise, but it seems like we have more evidence. Like when you get into the you know late 18th and certainly the 19th century, um, and 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 you see African American churches and denominations, you know, uh, flourishing and growing and resisting slavery, and there's a lot more. Uh, and it, but it just yeah it seems like there's a transition that happens at least in the in the U.S. Um, with you know kind of accepting and acknowledge by the by you know white Protestant Christianity uh, an acknowledgement and an acceptance of acknowledging you know African slaves uh, as Christians and yet still keeping them enslaved um, and you know having segregated you know seatings in churches and balconies and things like that so it's just it's like seems like there was a shift there from like the early um, you know the earlier denial of 
uh, baptism and denial of acknowledging as a Christian. Um, and then, you know, kind of later on, um, you know, uh, doing that where we have more more evidence in later times. But um, man, that's just that's so interesting. Um, but but yeah, you know, so, OK, so, you know, going back to you know, our, our theme, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's I guess um, I again, going back to your answer, like I, I would agree with it completely. You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, from my like, uh, you know, kind of non-specialist perspective, but, you know, just um, I mean, yeah, just a little bit that I have looked at in kind of um, the you know transatlantic period and all of that, uh, that, yeah, I mean, like you said, um, there's no denying that that there were Muslims present uh, in the in the slave trade. I mean, you think about people like Omar Ibn Said, you know, who I think is the first like um, first Arabic author in the history of the U.S. and, you know, was brought over from Senegal, uh, you know, over to, I think, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, mm -hmm. I believe, and, um, and and wrote copies of the Quran in Arabic. And, um, and then I think there's another um, interesting uh, story, uh, I think in the 18th century of a, of a, um, of like, a, I think a North African, um, or no, like a West African Islamic prince who actually was brought, um, who was stolen, uh, I think his name was like Prince Ibrahim, who was stolen as a slave and then brought over. Uh, but then he was recognized by an Irish uh, guy that he met and then, you know, argued, I think, with John Quincy Adams to free him. And then he was sent back. And so, um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's like you said, there's and then you have like, you know, uh, Islamic grave sites, you know, in places like South Carolina and, you know, with Islamic symbols on them. So, you know, no. Yeah, I think we're agreeing that, you know, nobody uh, is arguing that there weren't Muslims present, uh, just like there were Christians present. Um, you know, like we think of other examples in South Carolina, like uh, the Stono Rebellion, uh, you know, which like seems to have been, you know, one of the largest slave revolts in history was started by uh, Congolese Christians. And we've already talked about that, that Congo, the Kingdom of Congo was a Christian nation and that was through contacts with Europeans, but um, but it was freely adopted. It wasn't, they, they weren't enslaved or colonized in the 15th or 16th centuries. and so. Uh, many of those slaves that had come over uh, by the time of the Stone Rebellion in the early 18th century, they were Christians. They were they were freely Christians, and they were already Christians before coming over. Um, so that so you know we have uh, Christians and Muslims, but I, I would say that you know in slavery that most of those groups were the minority. Christian and Muslim were the minority, and that the majority of folks would have been practitioners of Yoruba or Akan or you know other traditional African religions. Um, is the is the is the majority. And um, and so, you know, I think that that's just um, important to like to, to emphasize, because especially for many in our, our audience in our community, when when talking to and engaging with uh, African-American or other diasporic, um, you know, uh, Muslims in Islamic communities today, there can be an overemphasis of, of, of mm -hmm. you know, pointing to those the, the presence of those uh, African slaves who were Muslims. Um, and then uh, kind of a desire to uh, kind of expand that to all slaves. That, that that was the case for all of us, that all of us were were Muslim and then Christianity was imposed uh, and, and Islam was eradicated, um, which is just not, you know, um, it's just not the case, as you said, is that, no, that, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's historically inaccurate um, uh, to say that all Muslims or all slaves were Muslim. Um, and I think that that that's important for us to acknowledge some of the religious diversity as people are engaging these claims to be able to acknowledge that yes there were muslims but not all of them were in the same way that those of us like myself and other many other people in the audience who are who are black christians and who are you know uh very you know kind of um committed christians uh, but yet i wouldn't make the claim uh that all african slaves were christians even though it's exciting <laughs> and great of course for me uh, as a black Christian to see that there were black Christians like those at the Stone Rebellion and, and others, but I'm not going to go so far as to say that, oh, that means all of them were, I, I would still acknowledge that with you, uh, that no, most of them were not Christians and most of them were practitioners of, of traditional religion. Um, and so, yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know if you had any, I'd want to make, uh, we, yeah, I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on any of that, but before we move on to the next question or. Uh, oh, no, I, I would, I just totally agree with you. I think that, um, it's yeah the the majority were pro like practicing not neither christianity nor islam although those were all present and then um you know and that there were you know just so many different rich african indigenous um religions and it's you know uh really important to sort of study those as well and to think about um you know also what it meant uh in terms of 
if someone then sort of decided to, pers you know, be, you know, wanted to become baptized or wanted to join a, a church community, like what did that, what did that mean um, for that? At, for that person and sort of their faith journey. And so, of course, it's hard to, it's impossible to ever really understand people in the past, right? But, um, you know, just thinking about uh, about what that relationship was and how um, Africans were sort of creating, new, you know, you know creating uh, new religious communities in the Americas uh, after they had been enslaved and sort of forcibly transported uh, and how important that that process was. And also, you know, how we will always have a limited knowledge because again, back to sources, you know, that not only are so many of the sources written by, by uh, white Europeans and white Americans, but, you know, these are communities where we know, and this is sort of Rabito's sort of um, fundamental, you know, classic work. It's, these are happening outside of the purview of enslavers um, in many respects. And so the intent Traditionally, like uh, sort of defined in a sort of a, a community that would that protected itself against um, sort of this society of oppression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. So, um, so I guess yeah, like you know, kind of um, you know, in line with, with with I think what both of us just said. Um, I think another another question that that honestly is you know is a is a that is related to this. Um, that uh, both I think African American Muslims and Christians have, um, you know, which is uh, different opinions on or, or different thoughts about is, you know, uh, maybe the big question then is looking at Christianity, uh, often the the perception, you know, kind of the other side of that coin in a lot of Islamic communities. And, it, you know, I mean, just to name a few, like, you know, it could be um, African Americans who are pr practitioners of, you know, maybe a, a kind of a more mainstream Sunni uh, Islam uh, that would be a little bit more global, but then also there's more localized groups like Nation of Islam or uh, the Five Percenters, or, you know, uh, that's usually what they're called, but I think the official name is the, uh, the Nation of God and Earth. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, you also have the more science of America, which a lot of people don't realize that was actually one of the first, even before Nation of Islam, and even before the, the Five Percenters, the, you know, Noble Drew Ali actually really was the first innovator of a lot of the cosmology uh, and a lot of the different ideas about, you know, black people being more, even the name, like the, the idea was that we were Moors, um, you know, uh, and that we were, you know, kind of from North Africa, um, you know, which, uh, which I, I find kind of interesting. Uh, maybe we can talk about this when we get to the next question a little bit more, but, but, um, but yeah, this whole idea of, of, again, that all black people were Muslims and, 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 and it was a race and slavery, um, and, uh, and being kind of from this tribe of Shabazz and, um, and, and being, you know, kind of the poor righteous teachers that are 5% of humanity that are meant to free the 80% that are led astray by the other 5% or the 90% or I get it, I get it mixed up, but the 144,000 and then all these different groups, but the commonality, even though they have a lot of differences about kind of their views of blackness and views of whiteness, even, um, uh, or even kind of, you know, pantheism that I think a commonality in a lot of these groups is again, that number one, as we've already, uh, kind of, uh, spoken to is that, that, that all or most black, uh, people were slaves. Uh, Africans were slaves, which is which is not um, not the case. But then the other side of that coin is that, and Christianity, on the other hand, that was imposed and that was forced upon African people. Uh, and it's a white it's a white religion. It's a white man's religion, um, and that that it encountered African people completely and only through. Um, you know, through coercion. And so for, for, you know, uh, for black people to be free and liberated uh, and to go back to their roots, they have to reject Christianity, which they see as a European imposition, and then go back to Islam, which they see as, you know, kind of the, the original religion of uh, black people. So I, I wonder, I, I, yeah, I guess I just wonder what, what thoughts would you have on, on that other side of the coin? Like basically like to put it real bluntly, like, you know, was Christianity imposed upon African slaves? Like, is that, is right. that the story of, of the beginning of, of African American um, or black American, um, you know, Christianity? Right. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, there's a really easy answer. The answer is no, right. <laughs> um, it was not, it was not imposed. And, but there, and I think that, you know, there are so many different important components to to answering this question, one of which, um, you know, is is your specialty, right? Like the ancient history of Christianity on the African continent. Um, another is sort of, I would say, what uh, is sort of understanding the history of slavery and Christianity better historically, and that and that really is my the the core of my research. And honestly, when I started my research, 
I was not expecting to find what I found, right? Like I, I had this kind of, you know, idea of Christianity being right, like a little bit, like as you described, right? Like used as a form of slave control, like, you know, uh, imposed upon, forced upon um, enslaved Africans. And when I actually started doing the reading in the actual historical sources from the 17th and 18th century, that's why I was so shocked to realize that not only was Christianity not being imposed, it was it was being violently rejected by Protestant enslavers. You know, like they were Protestant, right? And kind of what I was saying before, like they wanted to protect their Protestantism. They wanted to protect Christianity. Um, and they did not want enslaved people to be able to access it because it was a sign of, you know, freedom and rights and um, and liberation, you know, in, in so many different ways. And so, and so I was just so surprised because, right? Like the justification for, for slavery in part was like, oh, we'll introduce these quote unquote heathens to Christianity, right? Uh, but A, right, like not heathens, right? So that like, first of all, there's, they're, they're enslaving some Christians and Muslims as well as people who practice indigenous African religions. And number two, they're actually then not even, not only are they not trying to convert and baptize um, enslaved Africans, but they are, punishing and attacking um, enslaved Africans and freed Africans who are trying to access baptism. And they're also attacking European missionaries. And so that's really, and it was out of the surprise that I experienced um, doing my research that I ended up writing the book that I did, you know, Christian Slavery, because I felt like it was this, this, this part of the story that had been, you know, not just glossed over, um, really it had been the the story of Christianity and slavery and sort of this idea of how Christianity was imposed on ens enslaved people and people of African descent. It really just, it stems from like pro-slavery 19th century uh, antebellum literature, right? Like this effort to, to, to try to protect, to protect slavery as an institution when it's like teetering on the edge um, and saying, Oh no no no! Like it's it's fine. Like we make them become Christian, and um, they're more obedient and loyal when they're Christian. And so this i this sort of idea of right um, this the obedient Christian slave it comes out of that um, that lineage of trying to protect the institution of slavery. So the irony that you hear, you know, um, that you hear that that argument being sort of repeated by um, whoever you know whatever organizations but by african americans themselves like that's an irony that i think is um you know it's 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 kind of tragic right because we really need to go back to um the real story because there is there was this other type of oppression that was happening um in which you know uh enslaved africans were not being allowed to practice the religions that they were, you know, in, in, in some cases, we they were desperately trying to gain access to baptism or whatever. And so, you know, some of the, the most important sources for my research are, were coming out of these, you know, mission stations where you have uh, writings by, by missionaries, but also in some cases by um, enslaved and freed Christians themselves, uh, who were advocating for their right to practice Christianity to, to be Protestants, right? Like, oh. and this is, you know, 1730s, right? Like this is, this is early um, in, in sort of that's, that's the, that sort of long history. And, you know, I have uh, African and African descended Christians writing about the fact that they're being beaten for carrying Bibles by white enslavers, that, uh, that, <laughs> that they're being, um, you know, they're they're then using sort of the attacks that are that are coming on them and like reversing that and saying these you know white enslavers they are not true Christians, right? So they're they're using that whole line of attack, which we see you know that is a very strong um, and very le legit like critique within sort of the history of like um, Black Christianity. But yeah, you see you see this happening, um, and it's this. I think largely untold and uh, like uh, under-recognized part of the story that is absolutely essential to um, to sort of rectify the true history of the relationship between 
between Christianity uh, and slavery. Wow. Wow. That is, that is amazing. Man, I, <laughs> I just have to, I just have to underline if I have to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. And then I, I feel like for our audience, I need to underline something that you just said that if I'm, if I'm understanding what you're saying, and also as I've looked at your research, you're, you're saying today that, that not only was Christianity not imposed upon African slaves in the 17th and 18th century, but in fact, Christianity was actually attempted to be kept from African slaves. And that there, that number one, which is just like, first of all, just wow, that's amazing. And then number two, the second wow is that you're, I'm hearing you say that African slaves actually petitioned to be able to practice Christianity and were even persecuted for and critiqued the form of Christianity that was dominant and were even persecuted on that on that basis. Yes, uh, exactly. And wow. um, and and I there's this the the petitions that I'm re referring to. They um, they're written by they're they're uh, it's on the island of um, Saint Thomas, which is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was part of the Danish West Indies, and so these were. Um, these were Moravian Christians. Uh, so there's a Moravian uh, Christian community there uh, that was started in the 1730s. And they, uh, there's two petitions. Um, and one, I, I reprint uh, a, a handwritten version of it in my, uh, in my book, and it's by a woman named Marata. Um, and she, yeah, it's a petition to the Queen of Denmark, right? And she's saying, please intercede on our behalf. We're being you know, we are we are trying to worship Jesus, and we are getting beaten for that. Uh, and you know, we need your support. And and it's it's really the most amazing document. And I I write about it in my book, but I've been doing more research on it since then because I it's written both in her native African language and in Dutch Creole, which is like the um, what they spoke in, in in the Danish West Indies at the time. Uh, and so you can see, and so it's in Fon. So she's from Grand Popo, um, so Benin. Uh, that's that that's sort of the, the region of Africa where she was that, that she was raised. And um and so you can see how she's translating certain things. And this is and this is the kind of document where you can not only recognize like, oh wow, there's this whole history of oppression, um, you know, towards black Christians in particular, um, you know, whether it's like oppression, you're like not wanting to allow them to get baptized or later on you have oppressions of black churches, right? Like that uh, because the black church becomes such an important, uh, you know, source of support and, and, you know, community building, et cetera, within the black community. So it's like no surprise. It's like, it's, um, you know, the, the object of like terrorizing violence, et cetera, et cetera. But that, you know, there is a longer history there. Uh, so you see that in the letter, but you also see um, sort of the, the interaction between, you know, West African religious traditions and, and Christianity and the way that she's writing and translating. Um, and it's just, it's just fascinating. And Maratha in, part, in particular, I, I'm, I, uh, the, there's one historian, Ray Key, who who um, postulates that she um, she had been baptized. She was she had been Catholic in um, in West Africa before she was enslaved, and then she became a, a Protestant Christian in the Moravian Church. And you know, it it sort of unfolds. It's like you start with this one document, and then you can sort of unfold the pieces, and you realize like there's just this whole world opens up. And even though we'll never really be able to understand her life a hundred percent you know it's just like doing that research and digging in um i just i just feel like it 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 reveals um such an important different story um a more complex story and 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 a, and a far more like relatable story i uh, about about this history you know the history of of black christianity that's um you know so rich and 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 I just I wish we had more of those kinds of documents, but the ones that we have, um, you know, we just gotta we just gotta keep keep digging in them and learning more from them. And 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 then and on top of that, 
for all of y'all that are listening, when we have scholars like Dr. Gerbner who who finally uncover and highlight these sources, then you got to get her book, and so that you <laughs> become familiar with these these unsung heroes. Um, it was Matata was the name. Marata, yeah. Marata, yeah. we got to know about the names of say her name. We got to know about Marata, and and uh, because it just when you when you're saying that, that's again this is out of my areas. This is just blowing my mind, and but it just it just connects. I think with with a 2000 year history actually of African Christians who um, not only are they not imposed upon being Christians, um, but they actually often will suffer and be persecuted and even die in order to practice Christianity. You know, I think about Perpetua and Felicity who were North African martyrs in the year 200 who were thrown in the Colosseum in Carthage for being Christian by Roman authorities. And so you have African women Christian dying for their belief in order to be able to practice it. Uh, and then, you know, I, you jump ahead to like Egyptian or uh, or Ethiopian theologians uh, and churches like, um, you know, like Timothy Elyris or Benjamin of Alexandria or, or Georgius of Sagla, these, these Christians who are actually being persecuted by the dominant European church because they have a different Christology. You know, you have the Chalcedonian and Miaphysite debate, but then that resulted in, you know, European Christians imposing in East Africa their particular expression of theology that created this bitter conflict. And you have these African Christians who have their own practices and are being persecuted. Their bishops and monks are being killed. Um, and, and, and then, you know, you jump all the way ahead to, you know, even now, like, I mean, the it just, just seems like such a seamless, kind of through line throughout African Christianity that when you're talking about the slave religion or during the during slave days, you have uh, early slave Christians who are actually um, petitioning for their freedom. On the other side of the continent, we mentioned Congo, you have Nzinga Mbemba, who's writing letters to Portugal, like condemning their slave practices in the West African coast and they're, that are going on inside of Congo. And he actually says in his letters, we don't want like, you know, your guns and your technology and all that stuff. We want Bibles and we want priests and we want Eucharistic elements for communion. So you see this constant, uh, and then, you know, uh, going up into the 19th and 20th centuries, the, you know, the Negro spirituals and the, um, even though we were given a slave Bible in order, you know, that took passages mm -hmm. out and to mm -hmm. justify slavery, because again, they were afraid of, of actually hearing the true gospel that even still you have all of these, um, you know, slave narratives, uh, you know, even the distinction you were talking about, about the critique, it reminded me of people like uh, Harriet Jacobs or or Frederick Douglass, who, who you know, made a distinction. Frederick Douglass had the famous quote, like, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I see the widest possible difference. And to be a friend of one means to be the friend of another or to be the enemy of another. Um, and then you go all the way to the black church or the civil rights movement and how that came out of the church. It came out of, you know, black pulpits. And so it's just, um, oh man, it's just, uh, and then on the flip side, um, you know, especially if we're talking about imposition. I mean, you know, uh, I think that we also have to acknowledge the fact that if we want to, you know, if we want to, um, if we want to go back, you know, like if, if, if the claim wants to be made that Christianity was imposed upon African people and whereas Islam is the true religion of Africa, I think we have to examine that claim a little bit and go back even further and look at, well, you know, how did Islam actually first come into Africa? Because in the year 642, the first, you know, uh, the Rashid and Caliphate, uh, first invading army came in by the sword and conquered Egypt and Tunis uh, or Carthage and then built Tunis. And um, and so and then going forward, even now, you know, and you were talking earlier about what sources, you read, even Islamic sources, historiographers will. This is where we get this information, like historians like Ibn Khaldun who himself talked about how the kingdom of Ghana was conquered um, by the Almoravids in you know, modern day Morocco. And then that's when they began to practice Islam. So yes, Islam was very prevalent in you know, Timbuktu and Mali and Ghana and Songhai, but how did it get there? It actually happened through conquests uh, from North Africans who themselves were conquered several centuries before. But, you know, at the same time now, you know, uh, to be to be, you know, historical and accurate. And it's not this is not to say um, that that even African Christianity is completely free of conquests or, you know, military conquests, because certainly, especially when you get into the 13th and 14th centuries in Ethiopia, there are, um, you know, as a Christian empire, there are actually uh, examples of conquests, you know, with kings like Yakuna Amlak and Amda Seyon uh, and Zari Yaqob, that there are examples of them also imposing Christianity through military might. Um, you know, in surrounding, you know, regions like the Gojam and the Hadia. Um, and, uh, and, and so there are, it's not to say that, it's not to paint some kind of idealistic picture that 
that um that you know yeah like like christianity is you know or, or even african christianity is perfect and you know there's no there's no flaws in that history um but again uh, when we when we go back and look at the sources um as you as we've already said um yeah it's 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 wildly inaccurate to say that all or even the majority of african slaves were muslim um and it's also worth mentioning that uh that while there are evidences of even Christian conquest uh, in even in Africa, that's actually a minority. And the majority of early African Christians were themselves in usually minoritized and persecuted situations uh, in the antiquity and the medieval period and in the early modern period on both sides of the ocean. Whereas the flip side is actually true that um, that there that that yes, in the same way, while early you know, kind of 13th, 14th century uh, African kingdoms, many of them practice Islam freely and developed Islamic, you know, schools of scholarship and all that. But that when you look at the origins of it, it was more often than not through military conquest. And so uh, if anything, there was a large degree of imposition uh, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to Islam um, and and not really as much when it comes to Christianity. Um, yeah. But I, just, I don't know if you, you know, sorry, that was a lot. So I don't know if you have any. any <laughs> no, that was so impressive. You just, you know, covered so many thousands of years. And it's, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, no, I just, I think that is, it's true, right? Like, um, and, and we just need to think about, uh, you know, like follow the sources, um, you know, like think again about why we've hear, we've heard the narratives that we had, right? Like, it's not just like, look at the sources. It's like, why is this narrative so prevalent, right? And then, you know, that, like, if we start to answer that question, it's like, there's usually some, you know, some reason that someone wants that narrative to, uh, to, to be sort of a prevalent, uh, a prevalent narrative. And so, yeah, we have to, we have to look at, at the actual history and, um, and, and sort of, and be okay that it's super complex, right? Like that there is, uh, there is, con you know, history of conquest is not, you know, it's, it's part of both, you know, Islam and Christianity. Like that's just, that's just, the, that's just the history, you know? And then also when we look into like the individual stories though, that's where you really get to see what, what these religious traditions meant to, to people and in there, especially like people who have been enslaved are being oppressed, right? So like people like Maratha and to see what it meant to her and try to um, try to sort of balance that sort of macro, right? Like the, the macro uh, history of whatever conquest and religion with the micro history of, well, let's think about, um, you know, this person's like the way that they, you know, why they worshiped, you know, like how that connected them to um, their kin, their community, their ancestors. And so the, that's, I think that sort of that dual, um, that dual recognition and being like, okay with the complexity, that's, um, I think that's so important uh, when we're, when we're having these discussions. And yeah, I, I totally agree with what you were saying. It was like an amazing sort of <laughs> wide ranging sort of synthesis of tons of scholarship. So Oh, no, thank you so much. And actually, I, I think that, you know, what you just said, you know, is really actually a good kind of way to, you know, close out our time is, you know, I, I couldn't agree with what you said more. And um, yeah, just like, um, you know, and maybe, uh, I mean, I, I just, you know, loved if you have any other kind of just closing thoughts, but, um, but I think that, you know, what you just said really helps to um, you know, uh, I can maybe share just a little bit and maybe I'd, I'd love to give you the last word and, um, and, uh, but just about, yeah, how we go, how we go from here and, and just, you know, especially with, you know, the black community and the black church in mind, but really for all of us, like what, you know, what's just the best takeaways in terms of how we should begin, how, what is the best way to look at, um, kind of, uh, this particular topic of the role of Islam, um, you know, in, uh, in you know uh in in our ancestry and you know people of african descent ancestry and kind of how we got here uh to the americas and i would just I, I would you know the only thing i would say is just kind of um just echoing what you said uh which is really looking at all the sources um and 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 appreciating the nuance right and not wanting to read into history what necessarily we want to see or what we think should be there but just looking at what's there um and i think that 
uh, you know, we've mentioned some some sources, slave narratives and 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 other sources that people can look at. But uh, but also, I, I, again, I want to encourage people to get the book Christian Slavery and 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 it'll open you up some even more sources and and read some of these other, you know, uh, some of these other slave narratives that that show us these these realities that, again, I mean, my two cents would be that we should definitely not be seeing uh, our own history as like, oh, we were all Muslims. And then we, you know, then it was taken from us like, no, not at all. Some of us were, as we've already said, yes, some were slaves, some were Muslims, but that's a minority. And also some were Christians. But that's also a minority. So I'm, as a Christian, I'm talking to my fellow Christians and say, I don't want to I don't want to Christianize the entire, you know, uh, uh, African population, you know, pre-slavery, because that's just not accurate. Um, and I'm a Christian. I'm a dedicated Christian. And I, my hope is that the gospel goes out to all people uh, and my people and every everybody else. But but I don't want to be inaccurate. And I want to be, as Dr. Gerben said, accurate by saying that, no, when you read Olao de Equiano, Ignacio Sancho, uh, Phyllis Wheatley, Atobo uh, 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 Cuguano, you know, they're all giving us their own narrative and they're from Africa and they're letting us know. No, most folks practice traditional African religion. Um, and, and we've already had another episode where we've talked about how, uh, in my opinion, that there's elements with which that that is is in agreement with Christianity and that that it, that it's been demonized uh, far to an excessive degree. Uh, but at the same time, there's degree as a as a Christian. I'm not talking as a scholar, but as a Christian, I'm saying that there's also degrees to which it, it doesn't. But that's true for every culture. Um, right. And that's that's really, you know, uh, and, and, and also that Christianity was already spreading. Um, you know, uh, across the continent and was continuing to do so. Um, but that would be, yeah, I mean, that would be my two cents on just how we should look back at at this. But I'd love to just, if you have any closing thoughts on, yeah, just kind of, um, yeah, just how, how we should best kind of think back uh, on this question historically. Yeah, well, I I really, I mean, it's kind of going to be a reiteration of what you were just saying is just, is, you know, be honest about like what actually happens, right? It's, it's, Minority were Muslim, minority were Christian, majority were indigenous African um, religious practitioners. And, but most importantly, like read their, like when you can read their words, right? So it's like, uh, you know, sure. Like I would love when, if, you know, people want to read my book, that's great. But I would rather have people read Murata's letter, right? Like I would rather have people read, you know, hopefully most people have read like Douglas on this or like, you know, read Equiano, read African Christians and and uh, and Africans who are not Christian. Just read what they were saying, um, and and let them tell you. Right? It's a. Uh, I think that the, those those gems that we have. It's like that's what we should. That's where we should turn to um, when we have them, and let them let them speak for themselves. Definitely, definitely. Well, man, I, I I just wish we had more time because I feel like I could just sit here and, and, and learn with you and from you forever. But well, same, um, same. But, uh, but we want to respect your time. So, um, Dr. Gerbner, thank you so much. Again, give virtual and physical uh, hand praises to the Lord for Dr. Gerbner's scholarship um, and for this time now. Uh, and before we go real quick, uh, Dr. Gerbner, I just want to also uh, just ask if there is any um you know, uh, ways that you would want our listeners to know what you're up to, like ways they can connect with you with your future work, anything you want to just kind of plug or let us know about. Um, yeah, just how we can stay connected to your great work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I ha I have a web where I sort of summary of some of the stuff I'm working on. Um, and one of them, like you mentioned, Caribbean Reformations is one where I'm trying to sort of center uh, like black theological uh, history within in the Caribbean um, and to sort of decenter the history of like the Reformation from Europe and really like try to think in a more like African diaspora context. Uh, and then, so I write a little bit about that on my website, which is uh, basically my name, KatherineGerbner.com. Um, but then I'm on, I'm on Twitter, I'm at KT Gerbs and I do keep a Facebook page, although I don't, um, I'm not like a, I'm not a super active Facebook user. Um, I'm more active on Twitter than I am on um, than I am on Facebook. But I also really uh, would welcome emails. Um, I try to respond to all all emails that I get. Um, and so my email address is kgerbner at umn.edu, um, and that's also you can find that on my website. But uh, yeah, I would again, I would just really welcome. Um, yeah, any reflections or, or thoughts that people have, uh, yeah, I always appreciate it. 
All right. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Gerben, and all of y'all definitely, uh, definitely connect with Dr. Gerben and her work because it's a blessing to the academy and to the community. So I uh, just want to, again, thank you so much, Dr. Gerbner. We look forward thank to doing you. this again. Yeah, this was really, it was wonderful. And I agree, I could just like keep on talking to you, but I know, I know your listeners also probably will need, <laughs> need a break as well. Oh, definitely. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Man, that, that was powerful. Um, our sister, Dr. Gerbner, uh, is, has been a blessing, uh, drop some gems, but also, um, you know, I appreciate, I just echo what she said actually about, uh, going actually to the primary sources. That's what, you know, I, I got my book out multitude of all peoples, but, you know, I try to encourage people to read, you know, read Shenouda, read, well, out the Patriots in their own words. So, uh, that's, that was great stuff. And also just, um, thank you again for tuning in to another, uh, episode of the Bisrot. Today we talked about, uh, is Islam, the, uh, original religion of African slaves and and uh, what Dr. Gerben and I both uh, put down uh, based on the evidence is that for a minority it was, but for the majority, uh, it definitely was not. And the gospel, uh, the bisrot, has been present among uh, African people from day one uh, and, um, and, and in a way that was not oppressed or imposed as it often was in the case of, of Islam among African peoples. Um, so, uh, but definitely follow up, uh, we'll, you know, stay connected with uh, myself and Dr. Gerbner, she was saying, um, to continue this dialogue. Um, but other than that, we will sign off now and we will uh, we will holler at you on the next uh, episode of the Bisrock podcast. So uh, thank you very much and God bless you all.